We tend to live our lives based in what we believe to be true about ourselves, our world, our capabilities, our limits. Would would you agree with that? That pretty much we do that. As I began to understand this principle that is so well described in some of our most ancient and cherished traditions, what I found was that our beliefs, our limits, our capabilities, who and what we believe we are, more often than not, they come from other people, what other people tell us, what science tells us, what ancient religions have told us, what culture and history and our own families and friends have told us. And as well-intentioned as all those things are, my question was, what if they're wrong? What if they're wrong? What if about 1,700 years ago, there was an idea implanted into our global consciousness that says, maybe we're not as powerful as we've been in the past, or maybe we cannot heal our bodies, or create peace between nations, or interact with the forces of nature the way that we have in the past. Let me ask, how many think that there is a power, a force within you that has yet to be tapped? This unleashed. Why aren't you using it? If it's there, why, why don't we use it? I ask myself the same question. We live our lives based upon what we believe to be true. What if those beliefs, as well-intentioned as they are, what if they're wrong? Just how powerful is belief in our lives? Well, I'm going to tell you just a little secret that I've learned. Before I offer a program in this country, I usually test it out in a couple of other countries. And my thinking is, if I can convey the idea through a translator to non-English speaking people. Maybe it'll make sense here. And one of the first things I found is that you cannot simply walk into a room full of people and say, hey, there's a power that lives within you that is yet to be tapped. Because your left brain is going to say, oh yeah? How do you know? Prove it to me. Show me. I think that we're willing to change what we believe to be true about ourselves if we're given a good reason to change those beliefs. So we're going to talk about the discoveries that change who we believe we are. What does science say about who we are? We're going to come to the conclusion, to the understandings, that you and I are not limited by the laws of science. And there's a little asterisk right there, because that means as we understand those laws today, we are not limited by the laws of biology. You're not governed by your DNA the way you've been conditioned, and I was conditioned to believe that we are. We are not bound, we are not limited by the laws of physics as we've been led to believe those laws exist today. And I'll tell you what, if you free yourself of the laws of biology and physics, tell me what we can't do. You tell me. We're not limited by the laws of science as we know them today, and I'd like for you to have the opportunity to experience, not just talk about, but to experience the healing language in the field of intelligent energy that connects everything, the field that is now being called the divine matrix. How many are familiar with a brilliant teacher named Neville? He was a, a early 20th century teacher and philosopher, simply went by the name Neville. Uh, He wrote a book in 1952. It was called The Power of Awareness. It's a simple book. Each chapter is about a page and a half long. And you'll read that chapter and you'll think about it for two weeks. Really powerful stuff. 1952, Neville wrote The Power of Awareness. And his stated intention, he said, the reason I am writing this book is, quote, he said, to reveal our infinite power against which no earthly force is of the slightest significance. Think about that. Do you believe you have a a power within you over which no earthly force is of the slightest significance? Do you honestly believe that? Do you want to believe it? Let me ask that. Do you want to believe it? That's all it takes. Because if I can share with you, together we can give our left brain a reason to think differently about ourselves. Our left brain then steps out of the way and frees up our hearts to experience the power and the passion of what that's all about. Neville described this power in us, and he used a catch-all term called belief. And I know you all have heard a lot about belief. I just want to give you an example of the power of the belief that Neville talks about. He, He gives case history after case history, true story after true story, of the power of belief and the miraculous things that can happen. And one of the most poignant for me, he was notified of a young man who had been uh, diagnosed by Western medical doctors with what they called an irreversible uh, heart condition 
uh, and he was dying. And he had every reason to live. He had a beautiful wife. He had two beautiful, beautiful children. And he was in his 20s. And Neville went to his bedside, and the man didn't want to die. But he was so weak by the time Neville got to him. In Neville's words, the man had shrunk to almost a skeleton. He said he couldn't even speak. All he could do was nod his head in recognition of what Neville would say to him. And Neville began to ask the man, rather than wanting his healing or praying for his healing to happen, if you pray for something to happen, what have you just implied? Think about it. If you're asking for it to be present, even when it's well-intentioned, you may actually be acknowledging the fact that the healing isn't there already. Please let that healing happen. It means it's not there right now. We'll talk more about that. Neville asked the man, he said, I know you can't speak. He said, do this. Experience yourself as already healed. Not getting healed or on the way to being healed or the long, slow process of thinking about the possibility that you're maybe going to begin the healing process, because that's our conditioning, is that things take a long time, that they're slow and and changing. Neville said, experience yourself already healed. He said, when the doctor comes in, in your mind, see this happening again and again. See the doctor looking at his chart in amazement and saying to himself, it's a miracle, it's a miracle that this man is healed. Six weeks later, Neville visited the man in his home. The man got up and walked out of the room a couple of days later The doctor said it was an unexplained, spontaneous miracle. So they put that in a little pile, and they say, we'll come back and study that later. But first, we've got to cure cancers, and we've got to cure heart conditions, because it doesn't make sense. There's a disconnect in in the Western medical model when you see that. Neville asked the man to experience himself as if he was already healed. How much power does belief really have? Maybe, any firewalkers in here? Anyone here done the, the powerful firewalks? Amanda Dennison of Alberta, Canada entered the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest firewalk on earth. Now, I've seen firewalks 12, 15, 20, 30, 50, 100 feet long. She was twice that. What she did was this. She crossed a 220-foot pit with temperatures averaging over 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit. 220 feet, unscathed, not a blister on her foot. And I'm not recommending that you try something like this unless you're really prepared to do it. And firewalkers that I've known said, if in the middle of that pit, if a doubt enters your mind, it's all over. (laughs) But that didn't happen to Amanda. She crossed this 220-foot pit, averaging 1,700 degrees. And the question is, when something like that happens, she has no injuries, why? Why would she have no injuries? What is it? within her that allowed her to have an experience that physics says shouldn't happen. What is that? You tell me. Belief, of course. It's it's her belief. What is the common link between Amanda's firewalk and Neville's young man with a heart condition? What is it within both of those people that allowed them to transcend the condition of their lives? This audience participation, what was it? Of course, belief. And we know about belief... Rarely is belief defined for us, and I felt like it would be an honoring thing to do to define what we're about to talk about so we can talk about it. And I know belief means something different, deep and personal to everyone in this room. For the purpose of what we're doing, I'd like to define belief as a marriage of thought and emotion. When we are marrying our thoughts and our emotion, what we do is we are literally translating the invisible energy or the waves of a quantum possibility into the visible matter or the particles of our real world. Quantum physicists tell us that there's a field of energy that connects everything, and in that field, all things are possible. Everything that you could ever imagine is possible in that field. Everything from the lightest of the light to the darkest of the dark. All the greatest pain and suffering and all the ecstasy and the joy and the abundance and the healing. And this is why I believe so many of our most cherished and ancient traditions say very clearly that you are already healed. Your healing has already happened in this field. This field is the blueprint 
for everything that happens in our world. The healing's already happened. What we must do is claim that blueprint for our lives. And the way we do it is by marrying the thought. We think about something. This is our modeling. In our minds, we think of the possibility of our healing or our peace or our abundance or our perfect relationship or our perfect success or our perfect careers. And into that thought, we pump the power of our love for that thought or our fear or our hate for what it is. And when we do that, that is how we translate the waves of possibility into the particles of what we call reality. Thoughts and emotions. I've done this enough years ago. This is the 20th year we've offered this work in one form or another. And I I thought I would bore you if I talked about thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And I'm finding a lot of people are asking me, how do you define? What's the difference between thought, feeling, and emotion? So are you okay if I do this just for a minute? If we make this definition and then then we'll move on from here. Thought, feeling, and emotion. This comes right out of an ancient Sanskrit text. They're showing the energy centers in our body. What the ancients say, and this particular form is in the Sanskrit tradition, they say that we are capable of only two basic emotions in this world. And they happen in the lower energy centers of our bodies. We're capable of what they call love and whatever you think the opposite is. So love and hate. And when you get really deep into the traditions, they're both, they're the same thing. But those are the emotions that come from these lower energy centers. They are a power source. A power source. And from that power, it's what we use to tear down the walls and break down the barriers of everything that stands between us and our most cherished desires. However, that power source is scattered. And if you've ever known someone that lives only in their emotions, you ever known anybody, maybe you live in your emotions, life can get a little chaotic when you're living only from these energy centers here because the emotion has to be given guidance, direction. And that guidance is from the upper three energy centers, according to Sanskrit traditions, that we call thought. Now, when we marry something that we're thinking about with the power of our love or our hate for that something, what happens is we create what we call a feeling. And by definition, feeling now is the union of thought and emotion. Does that make sense? You okay with that? We think about something, and into that thought, we fuel it. We imbue it with life through the power of our love or our hate for that thing. Does that make sense? You okay with that? When we do that, what's the one energy center that hasn't been accounted for? Our heart. And this is why the language of the heart is literally the language that allows us to create in our world. It's from our hearts where the ancients say this great battle happens, the battle between what we feel in our emotions or what our emotions are saying to us and what logic is dictating. They come together and the great battle happens right here in the seven-layer liquid crystal oscillator that we call the human heart. And when we do that, by definition now, we have feelings. Fear is a feeling. Sadness is a feeling. Joy, compassion, those are feelings. And those become our beliefs. And those experiences are the language that we use to create with. So, belief is the marriage of our thoughts and our emotions. It translates the invisible possibilities of what we feel into the visible matter of our world, of our bodies and the events that are happening around us. So, when you ask the question, who are we? I can say that you and I are literally reality makers. We're transformers. We transform the possibilities that we can't see into the things that are real in our lives. The key is, however, that we can make only what we believe. Isn't that interesting? We can make only what we believe. So the new discoveries in science now confirm that we're not limited by those laws of biology. We're not limited by the laws of physics, at least the way we've come to understand them today. So the question The great question in science, are you and I simply passive observers cruising through life with very little effect on our world, on our universe, on one another, or are we powerful creators? This is is the great quandary that science is struggling with right now. It's the kind of thing that uh, Einstein just made Einstein crazy when they were asking these kinds of questions. 
So I'm going to share two very different belief systems about who we are, and then I'd like to share the science that has only come about in the last few years, and then we're going to take that into a Tibetan monastery and find out what their texts say, and then we're going to apply it in our lives. (laughs) Einstein, I'm surprised when I read this, because I, I, I thought Einstein was much more holistic. But what I found was this, Einstein was of the belief. He said, we live in a world which exists independently of us humans. He said, the world can take us or leave us. The world really doesn't need us. He said, which stands before us like a great eternal riddle, at least partially accessible to our inspection and thinking. He says, if we're lucky, maybe we'll understand a little bit of what this world is all about. On the one hand... On the other hand, there was a colleague of Einstein's, John Wheeler, Princeton University, a contemporary of Einstein's. They worked together. They had very different ideas about who we are in the universe. Wheeler said just the opposite. Wheeler said we could not even imagine a universe that did not contain us, he said, because the very building blocks, the stuff the universe is made out of, are our acts of looking at the universe. Now think about that. He said the act of us observing our world is an act of creation unto itself. Just by looking, there are no passive observers, is what he's saying. There's no passive observers. The act of us looking at our world, our awareness, is going to create whatever we are expecting to see while we're looking. What a very, very different way of seeing things. They're both working with the same data. Very different way of seeing things. Well, if we'd like to know who we are... For the last uh, 90 years or so, physicists have done their very best to convince us all that we're made out of tiny particles of energy called quantum energy. Have you all heard that before? And they've they convinced me. I mean, I'm, I'm with them right now. So 90 years, they've been trying to convince us that we're made out of quantum particles on the one hand. On the other hand, now that they've got the equipment that can really look at what these particles do, and these particles do miraculous things, they say, well, that has nothing to do with your life. You're made out of these miraculous particles, but it doesn't mean you can do the miraculous things those particles are doing. For example, quantum energy can be what we call visible matter. It can be a particle. That's what you and I are today right here. Visible quantum energy. That same particle can exist in the way that you can't see it as invisible energy. It's still there. It's just changed its expression. Quantum energy can be invisible energy, waves. A particle, a quantum particle, can exist in one place. It can exist in two places at the same time. It can exist in many places at the same time. And no matter where those particles are, they're always connected. Always connected, as if they are one and the same, no matter where they are. Quantum particles are not limited in space and time. Quantum particles are not limited in time. In other words, physicists can take a quantum particle... And they know everything about that particle that makes it as it is and what has to be in place for that particle to exist, okay? They can take it from the past five minutes ago and bring it into the present, okay? And they can change it in the present. And when they do that, it changes everything that happened in the past for it to get there. That's a mind boggler. What they're saying is that in physics... Those particles have the ability to go back in time and change their behavior. And they're asking, are we doing that? Do we have the ability to do that? Maybe we do it all the time. Maybe we do it so frequently, it's so common, we don't even think about it. Maybe the world that we see right now is as it is because of what we've learned from our past and we're applying it now. Maybe the world would be in a much worse place, a worse condition if we hadn't learned from our past. But this is what they're finding. So my question to you is all those quantum particles, are they showing us our limits? If we're made out of those particles, are they showing us our scientific limits or are they showing us our greatest potential? What do you think? Is it possible that the stuff the universe is made of could be the map of our greatest possibilities if we have the wisdom to see it? I mean, think about that. Can we do everything that those quantum particles just did? The big yes In documented instances, in current and past history, humans have done everything. They have been in two places at once. They have interacted with the past and the future and brought back that information. This phenomenon is so real. 
U.S. military uses these principles today, something called remote viewing. It's where an individual is trained to be in a room in a given moment of time, and through a facilitator, they are talked into a state of consciousness where time and space don't exist in the same way. And in that state, they can see in their mind's eye, in 1991, for example, where the Scud missiles were located in the battlefields of Iraq without having to send our troops in and risk their lives to do that. That can only happen when these principles are real and we understand them. Because in that state of consciousness, distance doesn't exist. Time doesn't exist. We can do everything that those quantum particles just did. We're all connected. You are not limited to the body that's sitting in this chair right now. I'm going to tell you that right now. You don't end where your skin or your clothing or your hair ends. What the experiments are showing is that the human energy system on the quantum level, extends many, many, many miles from the place where our physical bodies reside. You're all over the place. You're in my room right now. And I'm in yours. We're made of the same quantum particles that act miraculously. We're made out of matter. In 1944, the father of quantum theory, his name was Max Planck. He made a statement. And this is a powerful... I mean, today it sounds very... Current, 1944, he made this statement. As a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you as a result of my research about the atoms this much. He said, the stuff we're made out of doesn't exist. There is no matter as such. But he went on to say, what we see as matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. He said, we must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. He said, there's something out there that underlies, it precedes everything else. He said, this mind is what he called the matrix of all matter. There's a matrix of energy that underlies all things. It's not separate from us. We're part of it. We're in that field right now. So we're made of the same stuff that makes this matrix of all matter. What makes us different from those quantum particles? We looked at one quantum particle that could move forward and backwards in time. What makes us different from those particles? Well, we're made of a lot of particles. First of all, and our particles are all held together through a focus of what? Consciousness. Consciousness is what organizes all of those quantum particles into the stuff our bodies and our world are made of. I want to go back to something John Wheeler said because this is so profound and so powerful. Wheeler said, we're part of a universe that's not finished yet. He said, we're part of a universe that's a work in progress. He said, we're tiny patches of the universe looking at itself in building itself in what he calls a participatory universe. I love that word. Participatory. It doesn't mean that we're imposing our will. It doesn't mean that we're manipulating or that we're controlling. He says we're participating in the way this thing called the universe comes out. Now, I know it's easy to read these words and write them down on a piece of paper, but look at what he just said. He said, we're part of a universe that's not finished yet. It's still building itself. What Wheeler is saying is we'll probably never find the edge of our universe. Have you all laid awake in bed at night, as I do so often, and wonder how come they never found the edge of the universe yet? We got the Hubble telescope up there, and it keeps looking, and every time they think they find the edge, there's something there, and then they look beyond that, and they ever wonder why? Or you ever wonder why we haven't found the smallest particle of matter? We've been trying this since the 1940s. They take a little particle of matter in what's called a cyclotron. They get this thing going really fast. They smash it into another particle, make, just burst it in, into a, a bajillion smaller particles, thinking that we're going to find that ultimate smallest particle. And every time they say, oh, we've got it, and then that particle is made of something even more fundamental. You ever wonder why? This is the reason why. What John Wheeler is saying is we'll probably never find the smallest particle of matter. We'll probably never find the edge of the universe. 
Because what John Wheeler is saying, and you're going to see this, what the experiments are showing is the act of consciousness, us, awareness, looking and focusing with the expectation that something exists will put something there for us to see. The act of us exploring and looking, our awareness, looking with the expectation that something there will always put something there for us to see. What a powerful statement to make. And if you're not an astronomer and you're not a physicist, this still has relevance in your daily life. Think about this. What does it mean when you're conditioned in your world to be afraid of all the things that can happen to your body? Or all the things that can happen in that big scary world out there. And so every week you examine your body looking for something to be wrong and searching with the expectation that maybe something is there. I'm not saying not to look. I'm saying it's the consciousness that's there while you're looking. If you're looking with the expectation that something there and you say, well, it's not there this week, we'll see what happens next week. Can you see the implications? Can you see the difference between simply looking and examining and examining with the fear that something might be there, like a lump where it's not supposed to be? Do you get where that's, where that's coming from? Powerful. This is powerful stuff that Wheeler is talking to us about. Bottom line right now, an intelligent field of energy unites everything in the universe, number one. Number two, the stuff we're made of is a materialization of what's in that field. All the good and all the bad, all the light and all the dark. The field doesn't know about right and wrong and light and dark. It's a neutral field, unbiased. It simply allows us to create within this field. And the quantum language of belief and emotion is what gives us a power to translate what's in that field into what's real in our world. And I'm going to share with you why it is that you and I are wired to create. It's impossible not to create. If you're in this world, if you're alive and conscious right now, you're creating. The question is, do you know what you're creating? You're, you're making something right now. You're having a conversation. You and I are engaged in an ongoing dialogue with this field, this intelligent essence. And the field is talking back to us. It's answering us. If we have the wisdom to recognize we're feeling feelings in our bodies. That field is mirroring back in our relationships, in our careers, in our abundance, in your checkbook, in your relationships, what it is that you've said. This is leading to a new science and a new spirituality. It doesn't even have a name yet. It's based on beliefs. A lot of scientists are having problems with this. DNA doesn't govern our bodies anymore. Our beliefs govern the DNA that governs the body. As a dear friend of mine, Dr. Bruce Lipton, has so brilliantly, brilliantly shared. It's called epigenetics. To some scientists, it's a big deal. Bruce has been doing it since the 70s <laughs> and talking about it. It's based on belief. So the question, what do you believe about yourself? I'm choosing three representative experiments. Uh, there are others out there that show the same thing, but I, I thought these were... Uh, good representative experiments to show you why we are not passive observers in our universe. Experiment number one, this first one, was performed in the uh, uh, University of Geneva in Switzerland. I was wondering, why wasn't it on the cover of, of USA Today or Time magazine? I mean, this is some pretty big stuff. But they make it sound very technical. It's not that people didn't know about it. This experiment was reported to over 3,400 journalists, educators, scientists, and engineers in more than 40 different countries on Friday, July 25th, 1997. About 1 o'clock in the afternoon is when it happened. What they did was this. They took a particle of light called a photon, and they wanted two identical particles, so they took this one and they split it in half and made identical twins. So now we have... Photon 1 and Photon 2. It's particle of light. This stuff, this stage, this room, the physical material of our world is made out of. They put these two photons in a little device that was made to shoot them in opposite directions away from one another. Seven miles from the center of this box to that target and seven miles from the center of the box to that target so that when they reach their respective targets, right there, they're 14 miles apart. That's a big trip for a little photon. 
And when they are 14 miles apart, what the experimenters did was a series of experiments. They disturbed this photon. They said they tickled it, is the word they used. They tickled it. So they tickled the one on the right. And when they tickled the one on the right, what they found is the one on the left acted like it was the one that just got tickled. (laughs) Even though they're 14 miles apart, they act like they're still connected. This is important to you and me, believe it or not. The question is why? Why would that happen? What the researchers have called this phenomenon, if you're reading any of the new science out there, it's called entanglement. I love that term, entanglement. What this experiment showed was that particles that are once joined physically, even when they're separated, remain linked energetically. It is important. Because it implies that once matter is connected, it's always connected. What is the moment in physics, or the moment that physicists say all things began in our universe? What do they call that moment? If we go back in time to the beginning of the universe, what's that moment? Call it the Big Bang. But what scientists say is there was a moment in time immediately after the Big Bang that our entire universe, if you could take all of the space out from in between the particles that make our universe today and take all the matter that remains and compress it. They say there was a moment in time when our entire universe was about this size. It was about the size of a single green pea. When I'm talking to these these scientists, I said, well, tell me about this green pea. And they said, well, they said when this happened, the temperatures were estimated to be about 18 billion, million, million, million degrees Fahrenheit. And I said, oh, come on, how do you guys even know that? And they said, okay, we don't, but it was hot. Okay, it was really hot. We know that. A long time ago, it was really hot. And then it began to expand. <laughs> the hot universe, the hot green pea started to expand. And it's still expanding today, according to the theories. But here's the, the whole point of doing this is because it was once compressed into a single connected particle that is called the Big Bang Singularity. What does that say about our universe? The instant everything was once physically connected. The experiments are showing that once things are physically connected, even though they're separate, the energy is still linked. And for me, this was important because my... I can't tell you how, ever since I was a kid, we live in the high deserts of northern New Mexico. And the native traditions in our part of the world, they always say everything's connected. And you want to believe it? And you say, yeah, you know, everything's connected, everything's one. But it doesn't look connected to me. It doesn't act connected. But this is telling us why we can say this and why we can say it with certainty. Everything that was once connected in the beginning of time, what we call the Big Bang, even though it's physically separate, that energy is still there. And the Geneva experiment is proving that even when we take those particles today and do the same thing, they're physically connected. So the question, are we still connected? Does this make sense to you? Why would we be connected? Is it helpful to know that once something is connected, even though it's energetically or even though it's physically separate, it's still linked? To me, that's useful. Next experiment. This was done by a quantum biologist from Russia's Academy of Sciences. His name was Poponian. He took a glass tube. He took all the air out from inside that tube, creating what we call a vacuum, suggesting that tube is empty, and already they got a problem because they know that tube's not empty. They know it's not empty because inside that tube, you're all an expert on what's in there, photons. Photons are in that tube. And they know they're there. The question is, where are those photons? Are they all, like, piled up at the bottom? Are they clinging to the sides? Are they hovering in the air? Where are they? So they, they built a device to measure where those photons are, and here's what they found. They found that those photons were absolutely random, every one of them. No surprise here. This is just what they expected. It was a good day so far for the scientists. The experiments are interesting, but what's really interesting to me, is the thinking that underlies the experiment. The question that Poponian asked, he said, what happens if we take some human DNA and put it into this tube with the photons? 
What he's asking is what happens if you take the stuff we're made of and you put it into a tube with the stuff the rest of the universe is made of, what will happen? Why should anything happen? There's absolutely nothing in conventional Western physics that says that the stuff you and I are made of has any effect on this stage or these walls or the floor or even one another. But look what they did. Put some human DNA into the tube and look what the photons did. The photons were no longer random. They actually aligned themselves with the DNA. Now, under strict laboratory conditions for the first time, they're showing what the ancient spiritual traditions have said for a long, long time, that we have an effect in our world, that human DNA is affecting the stuff our world is made of. Now the day changed for the scientists because they had to look at things differently. The photons became ordered when the DNA was removed to their amazement, the photons acted like the DNA was still there. Just like when you tickle one photon 14 miles away, its twin acts like it's still there. The question is why? There's nothing, nothing in conventional Western physics that gives us a reason why this would work. It's called the DNA phantom effect because it happens whether the DNA is there or not. So this experiment, number two, it says that DNA, the stuff we're made of, directly affects our world. It's the first time under laboratory conditions, the best of my knowledge, they've been able to show this. Experiment number three was done in 1993. The folks at the Institute of Heart Math, it was reported in the Journal of Scientific Exploration. What they were showing is they said that we want to know what is the effect of human emotion on DNA. When we change the way we feel in our bodies, what does it do to the DNA? Well, there's nothing in conventional Western physics that suggests it would do anything to the DNA, but look at what they found. Human DNA was isolated so they could measure its shape and its chemical characteristics. In the presence of what you would call gratitude, appreciation, love, compassion, positive emotions, the DNA relaxed. It changed its shape. It elongated itself. And this is the shape of DNA when we've got really strong immune systems. When the DHEA levels, those youth-affirming hormones in our bodies, are really cranking. That's what's happening right here. What do you think happened in the presence of anger, frustration, jealousy, hate, rage? What happened? Exactly. It wound it up tighter and a little top, just like that. And all they did was change the way they were feeling. That's all they did. They said individuals trained in feelings of deep love and appreciation were able to intentionally change the shape of their DNA. Human emotion produces effects that defy, that defy the conventional laws of physics. You and I have a power within us that is not bound by the laws of physics as we know them today. And these experiments are showing that. So, you put these three together, and uh, admittedly, I'm going through these at a high level very quickly. There's a lot more that we could do with these, and if you're interested, it's in the, in the open literature. The new discoveries are showing us this. Number one, emotion changes the DNA in our bodies. Number two, the DNA is changing the matter. When we change the way we feel, we're changing our world. If we know how to create the right kinds of feelings. The experiments suggest that this field of energy, Max Planck's uh, matrix is the conduit that makes this all possible. This field is so new, it doesn't even have a, a name, one name yet. Some scientists are calling it a quantum hologram. Others are calling it the field. Some are calling it the mind of God. And others are calling it the divine matrix. So we know that this field is out there. This divine matrix, if you want to think about what it is, it's the pure space where everything begins, the container for the universe, the bridge between what happens inside of our bodies and what happens outside of our bodies, and the mirror in the world around us, what we've become. And this leads to the, what is called the great spiritual mystery. The great spiritual mystery says that there's something we do in our lives that triggers a process inside of our bodies. Once it begins, it interacts us with the forces of creation and affects our physical world. So something that we do in our lives affects our physical world. And the experiments just show us how this works. If we don't understand it, it's a miracle. But if we do understand it, it's a technology.
And it is in some parts of the world. This is a technology. The key is it's something that we do. If we want to unleash that force, would you like to unleash that kind of force in your life? Well, I, I would as well. We've got to understand how it works, which we've just done, and we've got to speak the language, speak the language that it recognizes. So I want to go back to this photon experiment one more time. This photon is separated from this one by 14 miles. When this one is tickled, this one acts like it's tickled. The question is why. Why does it happen? The reason it happens is because, number one, we said they were entangled already. Number two, they are said to be holographic. The bottom line for what we're doing here, the way we can think about our world, is in a hologram. Every fragment of a something mirrors the whole something. Every little piece of a something mirrors that whole something. So, for example, if we're looking at the universe and we cut the universe in half and cut those in half again, every one of those fragments would mirror the entire universe. And you can do this again and again and again. If every fragment mirrors every other fragment and you make a change in one piece of the universe, what does that mean for the other pieces? If we make a change in one fragment of our universe, it changes in all the fragments. This is important because you and I are holographic in nature. That's why, that's why your DNA works the way it does. That's why you can take the DNA from a strand of hair and you've got the DNA for your whole body because that fragment mirrors the whole. You and I are holographic in nature. Every time we make a little change in terms of the way we feel about our world or our bodies, that change is mirrored to some degree in the world around us. So... With that in mind, when we go back to this experiment, this is important. This photon right here had an experience. It was disturbed. It was tickled by the researchers. This one acted like it had the experience. How did the information of what it felt like to be tickled from this photon get 14 miles over here to the second photon? How did the information get from here to there, or did it? Did the information have to get from there to there? No, because of the holographic principle. It says that once something changes in one place, it changes everywhere. That information was already there. It didn't have to travel. This is the reason why your prayers are so important. When you pray for your loved ones in the battlefields and you say, how does my prayer get all the way over there halfway around the world? You don't have to get your prayer there because a part of you is already there. That prayer is already there. The key is to focus on the clarity of the prayer in your heart. And it's already there. We are affecting the world in ways we're only beginning to understand. However, most people do it unconsciously. If we're all unconsciously muddling through the world, none of us have that much of an effect.